Okay, we got a surprise for Tom, a surprise for Tom. Somebody's on the line, and I am as scared as it gets about who this is. I think I figured out who it is. I honestly think I figured out. Okay, guess. Can I take a guess? Is this Tom Sizemore, the actor Tom Sizemore? No, I admire him highly, and emulate him but it is not me oh i know who this is i know who this is. this is one of my heroes this is a actual legit hero of mine please tell me who you see i don't know who it is that's why i'm saying things like that i'm hoping yeah you not a clue that's okay I, I, hey y'all this is peter buck it's peter buck oh my goodness i thought it was you peter buck from the legendary peter buck this is so special peter buck thank you so much so for- you were sure it was me after it was tom sizemore right so I was like, it's either Tom Sizemore or Peter Buck. It's a coin flip at yeah. this point. Now, Peter Buck, you are obviously a legend. Obviously, you know that. I more of a rumor. More of a rumor. Well, I'm going to confirm it. The rumors are true. You are a legend. I was a young boy in New Jersey, 13 tops. I had parents that. I would say, hey, can I go to uh, an R-rated movie? And then they would pull up to the theater. They'd go up to the ticket window and go, yeah, he's good. He can go and like, and then get back in the car and be like, we'll be back in two hours. So it was that kind of household. I remember saying to my parents, this is 1983, I said, I want to go to Rutgers University. There's a band playing the Student Center Cafeteria called R.E.M., and they're just like, yeah, sure, we'll drop you off. So they dropped me off. And one of the most formative l- events in my entire life was seeing REM with Let's Active opening a 13 year old. My mind was shattered by that, and I was changed forever. For the better, one hopes. Oh, for totally for the better. It was one, of, and it's just like, I remember I saw that show, I was excited. I was a little scared because that's when Michael Stipe was kind of kind of when you when there was no there was no in on it. If you you know you just got what the person in front of you was doing. That was how you figured out who this was. I remember being a little scared because he said "Welcome to Hell" before playing Radio Free Europe. That scared me a little bit. Somebody saying "Welcome to Hell," but then yeah, you know I seen. I seem to remember the whole let's play in the Taco Bell looking cafeteria <laughs> element of it, which is hellish in its own way. You do remember, you remember those, those tours in uh, like around when murmur came out. Oh yeah. And you know, especially playing the weird little college spaces and, you know, I mean, seeing what looked like your junior high school dining area with <laughs> my band in it. Yeah. It was, Weird and cool. Yeah, it was amazing. And then I saw you two years later when you when Fables of the Reconstruction, you were doing those free college shows. And I saw you play then. And again, look, this is saying a lot more about me that I was scared when I heard Feeling Gravity's pull. I was like, this is creepy. I was a very weak child, clearly. Uh, (laughs) Anything scared me. But then I went to your tour bus and you and Mike Mills were there and I was, they were like, you were, you were signing autographs for people. And the only thing I had on me was my report card <laughs> and, and you and Mike signed it and you wrote on it, keep up the good work for my grades. You looked at my grades and then told me to keep up the good grades. So, uh, I didn't, I guess that's, that's kind of a, a little bit of a bummer there. And I was just wondering, one of the one of the most exciting things about coming up as a kid with where REM was at at that point was the the openers you chose. Yeah, we always try to take someone that we're excited about musically or friends or something. You know, I think you saw us in 85, that would probably would have been the Minuteman. Yeah. I, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it, it was. I, I so many. Ba- I saw Let's Active open for you guys. I saw Flesh Tones. Oh, no, I didn't see the Flesh Tones. I saw. The, it, I saw the Capitol Theater, and then uh, Keith Strang came up and played with you, 
and you gave a lamp to your yeah. manager on stage that night. I, uh, these I are the, that. these are the things I remember. I can't remember the names of family members, but these things are tattooed on my brain. So it was such yeah, an, the, the family, forget it. No, <laughs> you know, look, just go with the music. If you meet my family, you'd get it. They're, they're kind of forget. Uh, no, that's horrible. I apologize. We all have families. If anybody in my family's listening, I apologize. That was a, a low blow. Um, no, this is so exciting to have you here. I wanted to, um, you, you, um, you, you've been, you just did this eyelids. No, no wait. I'm so sorry. Right. No, you produce the eyelids record that's coming out. Yeah. For- and I, I, I play with them when they're in town that, you mm-hmm. know, it's kind of like the old man's holiday. They grab me on stage and I play a couple songs. Um, but I, I've known Chris, since he was 12, he used to write to my band and Michael and I would write back and uh, tell him what music he should listen to. And, you know, I'm sure ruined his life in many ways. I mean, he is a musician now. So, mm-hmm. so, so mission accomplished then is what you're saying. Yeah. Ruined his life. You did it. Yeah. Do you, you just keep track? It's like, yeah, we got that 13 year old kid in New Jersey. Uh, we got yeah. him. Now we got this 12 year old. He's going to be a musician forever. It's just like it's uh that's that's you guys kind of moving through uh through America's youth. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was the '80s, and it just felt like there was a war on, and it was the guys in the brown suits against the rest of us, and you know, so yeah, it was you know, you get a chance to talk to someone younger, you know, you'd suggest music and you know poetry or books or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean, I remember being so caught up in stuff. Do you remember uh, remember uh, Volcano Sons? Do you remember that band? Yeah, I love those guys. And I um, I mailed them a cauldron that I bought, like a Halloween plastic Halloween cauldron <laughs> that I saw at like a at like a Walgreens or whatever. And I was just like, oh, they because they have props on stage, they have funny stuff. So I mailed that to them. And then a friend a year later came up with a live tape of them. And they're just like on stage just saying, you see this cauldron? A fan mailed us this cauldron. You think throwing muses are getting cauldrons mailed to them? No, we get, <laughs> we get cauldrons. So that was, those are the things that, that, that stay with you. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I ever got a cauldron, but you know, well, Give me your address. You might uh, might see a nice little fun package coming your way. That sounds good to me. Um, oh, wait, somebody else is. Wait, what? Peter, it's John. Hey, hey, John, how you doing, man? Good. How are you? Yeah, we got John Worcester here too. Peter was uh. Peter was one of he's he's always been one of my good friends, but he was a especially good friend during the pandemic. He would check in with me, which was very nice. Oh, that's nice. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. And what was your? I what, think it was mutual. It was, it was mutual checking in. I mean, you know, John and I always see each other two or three times a year for our various bands, and all of a sudden that stopped. So you know, we'd call and talk about what it's like doing nothing <laughs> or <laughs> seemingly doing nothing. Yeah, the absence of music. Um, what was yeah. the first time you, you, uh, I, I saw REM the first time I saw them JFK stadium. Oh yeah. yeah. Opening for the police, Joan Jett, Mad. Oh yes. Yeah. That was a great show. Mm-hmm. It was really good. And, uh, and then I think I saw them the day before or after you saw them at Rutgers. Really? Yes. Isn't that well, weird? Let's active. Mm-hmm. It's at Ir- Ir- Irvine auditorium in, on the university of Pennsylvania campus oh that's so cool that's yes. so funny that you and i didn't wouldn't know each other for for 15 years, 15 years. or whatever yeah. but then we were both seeing the same show one night yeah. apart um i have a question for peter peter my mm-hmm. memory my memory is you have a really good story of getting thrown out of the first sex pistol show in america is that correct am i remembering that right yeah they um they played at the Southeast Music Hall, which I went to really regularly. And they announced tickets were for sale, and you had to put a credit card down. And I was like 15 years away from having a credit card. But I called my mom, and I got the number. 
and I reserved two tickets, which just, you know, I assumed I had tickets and I went there. <laughs> All the tickets were gone. Oh, no. And, you know, there's a four of us sitting at the door going, well, you know, we, we reserved tickets. And, uh, you know, and, and the music started and the guy next to me just kicked the door in, glass flying everywhere <laughs> and we all ran in but you know i went there three times a week it wasn't like i was right. you know the people i was with got in and i ran around and saw the first two songs and then these guys who look like roadies for uh new riders of purple sage grabbed me and <laughs> beat my ass out in the parking lot you know kicked me banged my head against the car door um but you know that's probably the best pistols kind of experience you could have <laughs> <laughs> now, is that where you saw the those early Springsteen shows also? You were telling me about that once, how great that was. Yeah, it was the summer of 75, and it was before Born to Run. So oh. he played, it was the days when a band would just book three three shows, you mm-hmm. know, in a row. Um, I saw Patti Smith do four shows in a row, two sets a night. And he just went for every one of them. Yeah, the Springsteen shows were great. That was, yeah, you know, I remember hearing Born to Run and going, yeah, that's a pretty cool song, you know. I mean, uh-huh. Just, you know, it was like, I only really knew the first two records because that's all they had. So, Yeah, those bills back then are so funny when, like, that, the attempts to, like, force musics together, like, where, like, Chuck Berry seemed to be on a fair amount of... I think like, Bill Graham was responsible for yeah, a lot of that stuff. We're just, like, be, like, canned heat and Chuck Berry, you know. Uh, but, yeah, we, we had a lot of... Uh, <laughs> We had a lot of that in the South. It was like, well, we got two bands. We'll stick them on the same bill. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, Elvin Bishop, I think he lived in Macon. He opened for everybody. You know, you'd show up. You didn't know the opening band. It was going to be Elvin Bishop. (laughs) It was like, ah, Elvin Bishop opened for the Kinks and ELO and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. What was the worst? What what was the most mismatched bill you've been on the wrong side of? Personally? Yeah. Um, God, we opened for some like teenage ska band in 1982 out in Los Angeles and in Fullerton, which I don't even know that's Los Angeles. It's somewhere. Mm -hmm. And man, they hated us. I mean, just, just hated us. You know, I got so pissed off. I took off my shoes and threw them at this guy and then got in a little brawl and then realized that was my only pair of shoes and I had to go find them. And they were, you know, they got swept up and they were in the garbage with all the beer. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> um, you know that was just the way the world worked then yeah it was definitely uh kind of the wild west with so much stuff and you just were kind of grinding it out but you guys really did grind it out and it was so exciting like at the point to start following the charts and stuff and have like this like i remember just like i worked at a music store and i was just like they had the f- top 50 albums would be on like this display and i was just like please let murmur get in the top 50 and they will be mm-hmm. on the it'll be on the wall and i'll see it there and i was just so excited when i was just like it's at 48 it's on the wall i'm just like yeah. staring at it it's like i didn't realize how much free time i had back then where i would just stare at an album i already yeah. owned in a store just to see it be next to other albums yeah, I remember that. I remember when we went into the top 40 for like one week and it was like, holy man, that's just unbelievable. I mean, you know, it was kind of like, man, we got higher record placement than, you know, Love ever had or, you know, mm-hmm. any of the big star or whatever. It's like, God, how did that happen? Of course, it disappeared the next week. So, <laughs> yeah, the charts moved uh, kind of differently back then. You know, not that this crazy like first week explosions. And then, uh, that was the rush, the rush, the way rush albums would always be like, cause every rush fan went and bought the album of the day it came out. And then rush never like got new fans. So it'd be like rush new album in at number eight on the chart. The next week rush number 66. Cause there's just no new rush fans. Yeah. No, well, they didn't just do. Okay. Rush did all right. So what are you uh, what are you up to for the rest of 2022 now that things are getting a little um a little eased up? Well, I toured with Luke Haynes. Uh, we have one record out and another coming out. Went to England, got COVID, got stuck in a motel for ten days. Um, I've been doing shows. I'm going to Brazil to work with this guy that I've been recording with for years, named Nando Race. He's kind of like 
the Bob Dylan of Brazil. And so I've got a month of work in Brazil. Um, we'll see how that goes, but you know, it's something to do. I mean, I'm just so glad to be moving and, you know, doing something. Yeah. It's nice to be doing something. We're doing this 24 hour show, which it's very exciting to see all every, all my friends and every, we're all in the same place kind of for the first time in all, in years. So this is a very special night and uh, it's exciting to see everybody, but I know that s- six hours from now I'll be begging for uh, to just go to bed. I kind of wish I'd called in more near the end just mm-hmm. to see how dingy everything got. But yeah, no, I'm going to be pretty wobbly uh, by then. I don't know what, uh, I don't know why I said I would do this. Honestly, I don't know why, but I did It's something to have done. So, you know, if you have done it, you can say you've done it. That's exactly it. That's what, cause I, I wrote a book and no experience in my whole life was, was more the, this is better than this is better to have done this than the experience of doing it was like a living nightmare. And then. When it's done, it's kind of just like, yeah, I got my book. Oh, you don't have a yeah. book you'll yet? Be one of those, you'll be one of those DJs who did the 24-hour show and lived to tell the tale. Yeah, I'll come out the other side, uh, and I can just walk a little bit taller as I go down the street. Um, well, Peter, Buck, I appreciate this. We apologize for the tech stuff, and appreciate you hanging in there with this. This is a true thrill, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to be a part of the show. Yeah, it was totally cool, and I wish you luck in your next, what, 16 hours? S- something like that. Uh, good luck. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll yeah, talk man. to you soon. Good night. Okay, take Hi, care. Peter. Oh my hey, God. John, I'll see you. Okay. okay. Peter Bye. Buck. It's, it's, it's crazy. I had one of the most fabulous nights of my life with, with Peter. Really? It was September 11th, 2002. Okay. I was on tour mm-hmm. filling in. I don't know who I would have been filling in for, Bill Rieflin or Barrett mm-hmm. Martin. Okay. In the minus five. Sure. And Peter was the bass player. And okay. And Scott McCoy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, John Ramberg was on guitar. Okay. And uh, Ken Stringfellow mm-hmm. was um, playing keyboards. And there were no shows being booked okay. for September 11th, 2002. Mm-hmm. So Peter said, let's go to Dan Tanis. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we'll have dinner. Yeah. And, and we all walked, I think we walked at least five miles to Dan Tanis okay. from wherever our five miles. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh-huh. But, it, but it was fun though. Cause it was, it was the guys walking mm-hmm. you know? and, uh, and we get there and, and before we get there, he goes, Oh, you know, Dabney Coleman kind of hangs out here. First person we see in a booth, Dabney Coleman, Dabney Coleman, Dabney Coleman, Buffalo and, Bill. Him. Yes. And possibly the drunkest I've ever been. Mm-hmm. In my life that okay. night, I was still drunk at four the next afternoon. And, mm-hmm. but that night, um, little Steven mm-hmm. and Benicio del Toro yeah. were also there. Mm-hmm. And we all ended up drinking um, some horrifically heavy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Is it called grappa? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it was just the most fun. Mm-hmm. And Benicio del Toro goes, uh, have you ever heard of this band called the Flat Duo Jets? <laughs> this very obscure uh-huh. Chapel Hill duo. Yeah. Somehow he was a fan of them. He's just a huge and Flat Duo them. Jets fan. Yes. Yeah. That is yeah. insane. Yeah. Yeah. And then Pete Yorn drove us all home. because This is just, this is, it's, it's almost like you're just naming. <laughs> like you're, I feel like I'm forgetting one more FP mm-hmm. who was there. Yeah. Uh, John, you know the thing I uh, want to play for you when you mention one of the names you just mentioned. Um, let me see if I can find it. Let's see. Here we go. Are you ready? 
I think this is the clip. We want as many people as possible to be a part of this wonderful comeback by this amazing band. So for a one dollar. So what do I get with my pledge? You receive a four part download of the audio interviews with the Rascals conducted by myself and Dave Marsh. For twenty five dollars, you will receive a digital high def video download of the entire show. And that will be yours exclusively because it will be a long time before it ever gets released. If it ever gets released. And you'll receive the audio interviews as well. For a $50 pledge, you'll receive an exclusive DVD and audio CD of the show. Again, long before it's ever released, if it's ever released. Plus the video download of the show and the audio interviews. The show is called Once Upon a Dream, so we're calling the $100 pledge the Dreamer's Pledge. <laughs> the Dreamer's Pledge. The Dreamer's Pledge. pledge. You call this the Dreamer's Pledge. <laughs> 